Do you know what a hoagie is? Lightly golden brown, soft, but still chewy, these rolls make some of the best sandwiches possible. However, these rolls don't have many great versions in videos and recipes online, so I needed to step up and show you all how to make this delectable specimen at home. Because great sandwiches start with great bread. Hey everyone, I'm Ethan, a home cooking nerd who likes to find better ways to cook and share them with all of you. We've got a bit to unpack in this one, so everything is timestamped below, as always, if you want to jump around. But I have to say, this video brings me so much joy because hoagies are part of my childhood. And if you're wondering what a hoagie is, let me tell you. So if you aren't from Pennsylvania, have never been to Philadelphia, or ever stopped at a Wawa, you probably haven't heard of the term hoagie. A hoagie is a regional colloquialism for a sub sandwich. Thus the bread for a hoagie is a hoagie roll. It's typically a cold sandwich with various cold cuts, lettuce, tomato, and onion, mayo too. It's kind of interesting though that the term hoagie is really not said anywhere else in the country. For me, I grew up in central PA, and if you go to Green Ridge County Market's Bakery, which my family frequented, you'll see the term hoagie rolls. Now I was actually planning a different video where I needed a nice, you know, hoagie or sub roll, but I was a little bit disappointed in my store options here and the recipes and videos I found online. Other than Mike G from Pro Home Cooks, he's got a great cheesesteak video which actually inspired this recipe, so you guys should definitely check it out. Anyway, I think this bread roll deserves its own video, so I made one. And first we're gonna go over the key techniques that take this bread from okay to you'll never wanna make another sandwich without it. First, we need to understand the bread dough construction. In bread making, there are two basic groups of doughs, lean and enriched. Lean doughs are typically just flour, yeast, salt, and water. Think your baguettes, pizza, and sourdoughs, which are chewy and crunchy. Enriched doughs, on the other hand, have additions like sugar, butter, oil, eggs, milk, or cream. Think your brioche, your cinnamon buns, and dinner rolls, which are soft with a tender bite. These hoagie rolls are basically enriched baguettes through the addition of milk, sugar, and fat, but I've kept the amounts of sugar and oil on the low side, and I've also used a 65% hydration dough, which leaves the dough a little chewier like a lean dough. And though it's not exactly a crispy exterior, you'll notice some light cracks on the exterior when it's pressed in. Now that we've got that covered, let's walk into the next four ingredients and techniques that make these rolls shine. And I do mean that literally, like these techniques will help the dough shine. First is the addition of diastatic malt powder, which is basically magic pixie dust that makes your bread look and taste better. But let's actually unpack what it does because this is the first time that I've used it too, and I was floored by the results. From Kitchen Alchemy by The Modernist Pantry, we learn that diastatic malt powder contains amylase, which consumes starches in the flour and turns it to sugar. What does this mean for our bread? Well, with more sugar, the yeast has more sugar to feed on, which means more rise for an airier bread and increased browning on the exterior. Here are rolls that I made with and without malt powder. These were both 175 gram pieces of dough that were proofed for one hour. As you can see, the diastatic malt powder one rose much more and is larger and airy. Also, in side-by-side -side taste tests, it has that commercial bakery taste, which is exactly what I'm after. With these results, you can be sure that diastatic malt powder will be making return appearances on this channel. Next, let's talk cornmeal. We've used cornmeal for bagels on this channel to help prevent them from sticking, and it's the exact same idea here. The cornmeal will prevent those rolls from sticking on the baking sheet, but more importantly, in my opinion, it gives the look and feel of a professional roll, and some can be sprinkled over top to provide a little more subtle corn flavor. To me, these hoagie rolls just don't feel the same without a little bit of cornmeal. Next, egg wash. It's used to create a glossy, shiny crust and seal in moisture in the bread. For bread like brioche, you'll typically use the egg yolk, but for these we are just using the whites because I don't want them to be overly brown. And this technique really makes a big difference. You can see without egg wash, the roll has a dull exterior with okay browning. Compare that with the egg wash, and aesthetically, it's no contest. It also has superior flavor and texture, and that egg wash can be used as the glue for toppings like sesame seeds or herbs and spices. So if you have an egg hanging around in that fridge, definitely make an egg wash. Lastly, let's talk steam. You may have heard about using steam for breads in the past, but how does it work and what does it do? 
From On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee, we learned that steam increases the rate of heat transfer from the oven to the dough. Specifically, he notes that the surface of the dough will reach 195 degrees Fahrenheit in four minutes if you don't use steam, compared to just one minute if you do use steam, a 300% increase. As the steam condenses on the loaf, the water keeps the crust from drying out, which means more oven spring. More oven spring gives us a larger and lighter loaf. The water also gels the starches on the bread, giving us a better crust, the same idea behind boiling bagels in water before baking them. In summary, the dough construction, diastatic malt powder, cornmeal egg wash, and steam all play key roles in developing this beautiful hoagie roll. But enough talking, let me show you the step-by-step -step recipe, and then we'll make a sub and get out of here. To start, warm 260 grams of milk in the microwave for about 50 seconds. Ideally, the temperature is between 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit to optimize yeast activity. Then you're gonna add six grams of yeast along with eight grams of diastatic malt powder and stir that to combine. Let this stand for three to five minutes until some light foam surfaces and bubbles are visible. This is known as proofing the yeast and it's done to test if the yeast is alive. If there's no foam surface or little bubbles, the yeast is likely dead and should be discarded for new yeast. Meanwhile, add 400 grams of flour, 10 grams of honey, 20 grams of olive oil, and eight grams of salt to a large mixing bowl. Once the yeast is proofed, pour in the mixture and vigorously mix the dough with your hands until no dry flour remains in the bowl and a cohesive mass forms. This should take about two to three minutes. Next, you're gonna cover this with plastic wrap and just let that rest for 15 minutes. Resting will allow that flour to start hydrating all on its own and then make the dough a little bit easier to work with once we start kneading. Once rested, turn the dough out onto a clean counter and knead for eight to 10 minutes. Now, I'm not using my wood top cutting board because it kind of dries out the dough, so that's why I'm over on the counter. And I do advise setting a timer to make sure ample time is spent kneading because you wanna knead that dough until it is completely smooth and no longer sticking to your hands. After kneading the dough, cut off a piece and test for gluten development by carefully stretching the dough very thin to check for a see-through window before tearing. This gluten window test is the key to understanding if the flour has been hydrated enough, which is how gluten is developed. If the dough tears before getting to a slightly translucent window, continue kneading for another couple of minutes. Once done kneading, add the dough to the mixing bowl and cover with plastic wrap. You're gonna let this rise until it's doubled in size, about 45 to 60 minutes, though it could take longer depending on the yeast and the room and dough temperature. Once doubled in size, punch the dough down and divide into four equal portions, roughly 175 grams each. Using your fingertips, lightly press and stretch the piece of dough into a rectangle about eight inches wide and one inch thick. You're gonna tightly roll the dough from the bottom to the top and then press and seal the seam created on the bottom of the roll. Now you should have a log with the seam side down and then applying even pressure with the palm of your hands in the center of the dough, just begin gently rolling the log out into a cylinder about 10 inches long. And here's what it looks like from my point of view. Sprinkle some cornmeal onto a baking sheet and place each hoagie on it, evenly spacing them out. And then you're just gonna cover this with some plastic wrap or a towel and let the rolls proof until they're about 1.5 to two times in size. This should be another 45 to 60 minutes. With 15 minutes of proofing left, preheat the oven to 375 degrees Fahrenheit and place an oven safe pan or baking sheet on the bottom rack of the oven. Ice is gonna be dropped into this pan that will help create that steamy environment for better oven spring. Back to our proof rolls, using a bread lame or a razor or really sharp knife, score the hoagie rolls with one long slash at a 45 degree angle to allow air to escape when it's in the oven. Next, we're gonna whisk the egg white and a spoonful of water together, and using a brush, lightly spread the egg wash on the exterior to give us that better and shiny crust. I also like to sprinkle a little cornmeal over top, though at this point you could add toppings like sesame seeds or herbs and spices if you would like. 
Finally, place the rolls into the oven on the middle rack and toss in a couple ice cubes on the hot pan, which will create the steam. You're gonna bake these for 10 minutes, then rotate the pan and continue baking for another eight to 10 minutes until the crust is golden brown and the internal temperature reaches at least 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Let these cool completely on a wire rack and I actually like to store these in a plastic bag for one day before making a hoagie and here's how I like to assemble mine. First, I start with a layer of mayo followed by three pieces of provolone cheese. Now it's time for the meats. I went for four slices of roast turkey, three slices of mortadella, and six slices of salami. For some crunch, add lettuce, some fresh tomatoes, which are just starting to get good, and some thinly sliced red onions. Add a little drizzle of oil, a cap full of vinegar, and then some spices. I like doing a pinch of oregano, some fresh ground pepper, and a little bit of salt, and these seasonings are gonna help those flavor really pop in the sandwich, but we aren't done just yet. Absolutely critical in crafting a perfect hoagie or sub is wrapping it. Get a piece of parchment paper and wrap that as tight as you can. Then I like to let it sit for three to five minutes to let all those flavors get to know each other and kind of soak into the bread a little bit. Lastly, slice on a very slight diagonal and enjoy. It's everything that I could want from a classic hoagie or sub shop, and now you and I can make them at home. All right, everybody, that's gonna wrap it up for the video. Recipe will be up on my website. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I'm gonna enjoy the rest of this hoagie. Thank you.